Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to Hanson Dyer Hall in the spectacular Ian Potter South Bank Center designed by the man of the hour. Uh, my name is Richard Kurth. I have the good fortune to serve as the director of the Melbourne Conservatorium of Music. I arrived here just a couple of months after uh, this building opened, so I wasn't here for the opening. But tonight is a special night because this is the first time we're, we're welcoming uh, the public back into this room uh, since COVID started back in that time uh, last March. So it's, it's a very fitting occasion to, uh, in a sense, reopen uh, this space uh, in celebration of John Wardle and his award of the gold medal of the Australian Institute of Architects. The Melbourne Conservatorium of Music and uh, the Victorian College of Arts, of the Arts, are the two uh, sibling schools that make up the Faculty of Fine Arts and Music here at the University of Melbourne. And our campus is located here in South Bank on the traditional lands of the Bunwurrung people of the Eastern Kulin Nation. So I would like to pay our respects to the elders past and present. They, uh, they remind us to come with purpose, and we uh, are here for a very, very uh, celebratory purpose tonight. They also remind us to respect and take care of the land, the waterways, and the children of the land, that is, all living things, the custodians of this land knew that well. Uh, this is a space that when you enter the building, uh, you, you realize, and when you see it from outside, but in particular for me in the lobby, you sense it as a geological formation uh, with the lobby much like a waterway, a canyon uh, created with curves and a few alcoves as though they were formed by an ancient river. And uh, this room for me, uh, I realized a few months ago, because of the color scheme and the way the woodwork's here, uh, is kind of like a sacred grove. You have the, the hardwoods of Australia, you have the eucalyptus color, and we're floating um, uh, in space a few, few stories up. And so this is a sacred space for us where we celebrate music and we celebrate gathering. And I welcome you to this space in that spirit. And uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce Claire Cousins, who is the um, uh, former president of the uh, national president of the Australian Institute of Architects. Her, um, her studio, uh, Claire Cousins Architects, was formed in 2005. She specializes in residential and uh, residential project, projects and projects that cultivate nature and community. And uh, as I said, she serves, has served as, uh, she's a life fellow and has served as a past president, national president of the Australian Institute of Architects. And she was also a member of the, of the panel the jury for the 2020 Gold Medal Award. So here I welcome Claire Cousins. So thanks Richard for that introduction and um, wonderful to be here. I think it's the first time I've seen so many familiar faces in person for a good 12 months. Um, thank you, John, for kindly asking me to introduce you tonight. I also um, wanted to thank Richard and also the Faculty of Fine Arts and Music for their generously supporting and hosting tonight. I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and of the land on which we meet, the peoples of the East Kulin Nation. I recognise their continuing connection to land waters and community, and pay my respect to them and their cultures and to elders both past, present and emerging. So tonight I would like to welcome, most importantly, John Wardle, Susan, family, um, Dr Richard Kurth, director, as he was introduced earlier, of the Melbourne Conservation of Music, Institute National President, Alice Hampson, Chair of the Board, Lock Helen Lockhead, our board, some of our board members are here tonight, Institute CEO, Julia Cambage, National Councillors, Gold Medalist Ian McDougall and everyone else. Thank you for coming. So we are here to celebrate the Australian Institute of Architects' highest accolade. The Gold Medal recognises distinguished service by architects who have designed or executed buildings of high merit, producing work of great distinction that has advanced architecture or endowed the profession in a distinguished manner. The 2020 Gold Medal jury consisted of Helen Lockhead as chair, Geoffrey London, Peter Elliott, 2017 gold medalist, Wendy Lewin, and myself. 
Gold medal nominees are nominated by state and territory chapters, national council and national committees. So Helen, Geoffrey, Peter, Wendy and I met in September 2019 to consider 13 nominations. It's not us picking, plucking a person from anywhere. There's a, a series of nominations that we had to rigorously um, assess um, and going through very detailed submissions, assessing their work and engagement with the profession. And the jury was delighted to award the 2020 gold medal to John Wardle. I'll read a, a, an abbreviated version of the citation. John Wardle's work celebrates both individual craft and the broader production process of making a building. Since the formation of his Melbourne-based practice in 1986, John has devoted his energies to maintaining the design ethos of a small office to ever larger institutional and commercial projects across the country. Evidence of consistent peer recognition over more than 30 years reinforces the, the view of John Wardle as an architect whose contribution to the development of Australian architecture has been distinguished and substantial. In Victoria, he is a two-time winner of the Victorian Architecture Medal, the state's highest accolade. He has won the Harold Desborough Award for Residential Architecture three times, the Sir Osborne McCutcheon Award for Commercial Architecture twice, and the William Wardle Architecture for Public Buildings. At a national level, he has um, been the recipient of the Sir Zelman Cowan Award for Public Buildings, the Robin Boyd Award for Residential Architecture twice, as well as the inaugural Daryl Jackson Award for Educational Architecture in 2015. And when I say he, I mean John Wardle Architects. It's a collective pursuit, clearly. But uh, the gold medal is only awarded to a person, not a practice. Such, ac such acknowledgement of design excellence demonstrated across a range of building types and geographical locations is further evidenced of the deserved peer respect for the dexterity of his formal compositions, his programmatic innovations, as well as his engagement with residential, institutional and commercial clients. John Waddle is an, is an outstanding Australian architect who maintains an exemplary practice. Across the nation, he has restored faith in what architects do best, the design of buildings that function well and please the hand and eye. He is a most worthy recipient of the Institute's highest accolade, the gold medal. So I'm very pleased to warmly welcome John Wardle to the stage. Thank you, Claire. Thank you very much, Claire. Thank you also, Richard, and thank you for allowing us to come into your building uh, at this time. Well, as a, as, a, uh, as a resident of Melbourne, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land also on which we are meeting and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging, and the Aboriginal elders of other communities who may be here today. In doing this, we do greatly appreciate the rewards of our better understanding of the rich histories that we can learn from First, Na First Nations communities, of the places that we live, visit and work within. Well, I may be the first architect to have written the AHES Hook Address from the confines of a study within a family home during a global pandemic. So as I reflect on the many years of practice, I do so from a position of isolation, which is remarkable in itself since the foundation of the practice all that I have done has been with others. Receiving the gold medal is a special honour as this process is built from local to national and the assessment involved the advocacy of many peers. I'm deeply appreciative of their time spent sifting through the evidence to find reason to award me this honour. We're currently a practice of many in two studios in Melbourne and Sydney. We're led by five partners and four principals. Stephen Mee has devoted his entire career to this practice, working alongside me on his own and with others. Always profoundly thoughtful, he has been deeply enmeshed in so much of what we have achieved. Megan Dwyer has forged our path in the university and public sectors, taking responsibility for the strategic direction of almost all of the buildings in that portfolio. Though as Meg will remind me, the boundaries are diminishing and her responsibility is broadening. James Loder started with us as a student, won the Glenn Merkett uh, Prize and stayed on as an important design contributor uh, and has assisted greatly in expanding the design coalition in our practice. 
Matthew Van Coy focuses on the commercial sector and has taken us abroad with our first two commissions currently under construction, but also finds time to lead, lead initiatives such as a new normal, our solar pavilion as part of this year's Melbourne Design Week. Principals Minnie Cade and Jasmine Williamson have lives in Melbourne and Sydney that span a remarkable array of projects. And Bill Crateris is balancing work within the practice with his role as president of the Victorian chapter of the AIA. And Richard Sucksmith manages to manage, as well as any one person could, the entire thing. There are many significant others within the practice, as well as a family whose life has, under Susan's constant direction, been interwoven with that of the practice. There is much to unpick as I delve into the chronology of this practice. The buildings themselves are, are evidence of extraordinary collective endeavour. And I take this opportunity to thank all of those who have shared the journey. Architectural proposition always requires a critical audience that can appreciate and understand that the proof of our worth is in the buildings that we produce and the value that they create. We demand so much of a good client and I'm deeply appreciative of the many great people who have engaged with us. The drawn line is a fascination and gives great insight into practice. Nothing throughout the history of architecture has recorded authorship more than the conceptual drawing, the genius idea. Yet the drawings of many of our projects frequently suggest layers of authorship by many participants. As I review them, I recall many of the conversations that they were a part of. As I review them, uh, I realise also the uncertainty and the explanatory nature of them, and almost always they are incomplete. The ones that I've generated solely frequently require the participation of others to resolve. Now with digital technologies enabling so much of what we do, there's an unevenness of recording of both the conceptual sketch and the conversation that accompanied it. However, the digital whiteboard does record in the form of a digital diary the inputs of many participants and perhaps more accurately charts the course of a project's inception and development. I'd like to draw you into the stories of practice to expose at least some of the reasons why. In doing this, I can avoid any semblance of manifesto, as what we've achieved as a practice spans only part of the vast canon of architectural activity. I'll speak of collecting, of people, of objects and experiences. This underlying curiosity frequently draws me to appreciate most the work of others that is unlike our own. For my part, it has been 34 years of running hard, always forward but frequently deviating to navigate new territory. As a first generation practice, addressing new experience has been a constant. Too often I've been concerned with the running, too much so to be, give much thought to the direction. In writing this address, I'm aware that there's a sense of navigation that looking backwards can provide. The patterns become apparent despite the fact that until recently there's never been a script. Having spent most of 2020 in lockdown in Melbourne, my year was shaped by seeing the world through two dramatically different and shifting lenses. From the domestic setting of my home, the realities of isolation and confinement were felt profoundly. Yet by contrast, it was also a year of extraordinary connection. Amid this play of proximity and distance, people became data, numbers, percentages, averages, and yet also highly personalised. Faces on screens set against living rooms, bookcases, and much evidence of personal and family life. And at times an unsat unsatisfying merging of intimacy and physical detachment. We've been forced to reappraise what's on our doorstep, the specific things that define communities and our places within them. The five kilometre rule in stage four of our lockdown in Victoria mapped powerful evidence of social inequity. Accessibility to green space, to cultural institutions and other necessities of life are unequally distributed in our city. The disparities in communities are acutely apparent. Recent substantial shifts in density in many areas of our cities have exhausted the capacity of the public domain created by earlier generations with little contribution by those responsible toward necessary new social infrastructure. Throughout history, we can refer to the evidence of work of architects recording moments of change. Many have been in response to traumatic occurrences. These have at times been times of great invention, of creative practice shifting radically 
on platforms of new technologies, and importantly, new codes of cultural practice in concert with society embracing change with an understanding of its necessity. A natural push-pull tension in our current situation undoubtedly exists. The push to get the economy up and running is constantly on our minds. Stimulus packages are driving projects and grants forward. Conversely, there's a genuine desire for many to pause and reflect on the way we design cities, homes and workspaces and do it more intelligently, more sustainably. To lose ground on this over the urgency to kickstart the economy would demean the deeper lessons of COVID-19. Being able to adapt and survive, to prosper and benefit from change will be a measure for success. The constantly shifting tempo of our liaison with others has always been at the foundation of our practice. We are currently through a series of workshops inviting many within the practice to consider major changes to the way we operate under the themes culture, technology and service. We see this as a time, as a time in our own history to undertake, undertake substantial change. The measures for success of what we do are now far more complex and the circumstances that inform them changing constantly. We appreciate the advantages of new methods of timber construction and prefabricated assembly as we sequester carbon harvested from trees, but remain uncertain about the processes of removing them from their forests. As we design buildings to be less reliant on artificial air management systems, we've experienced a summer where cities have been choked by the smoke of intense, intense bushfires and forms of operable ventilation have remained closed. We must add density to our existing suburbs, but as we do, we're aware of the substantial loss of the suburban landscape. We appreciate that technology in its, mesi, in, in its many forms is causal and in, 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 in so much that we now contend with but is likely to be redemptive in many of the solutions that we seek. Two key concerns, early innovation and the self-imposed injustice of constantly lowering scale of fees are working against the resourcing of project-specific research and that critically important design development phase of architectural service as we engage with issues of far greater complexity than ever before. We're rarely empowered, empowered to directly change political will or the metrics of large development corporations, but we can manoeuvre into place powerful examples of built work that can shape community values and affect change. So much of what we do is responsible to the immediacy of the present, while being attuned to the need to be purposeful, responsible and build well as if for eternity. At times I'd have to admit to driving more than a skerrick of anxiety into our processes and our practice to endeavour to accord with this. And here lies a conundrum. Our fleet of four buildings for the University of Tasmania, most particularly the latest two designed entirely during lockdown, have under the urgings of an engaged Vice-Chancellor deeply considered finite resources and sought to understand and optimise the environmental costs of structure and fabric. We've worked closely with industry more than ever before to appraise the origins, utilisation, assembly and inevitable dismantling to evaluate total carbon utilisation through a circular economy. We have developed an architecture of expressive assembly and in doing so contemplated its complete disassembly one day. Now it gets to the, the romantic bit. As a 12 year old growing up in Geelong, I bred bantams. I take a journey from our home along the edge of the Barwon River along its winding course to an old farm where a family, amongst other things, bred bantams. I'd swap my pocket money for one or two chicks and tuck them under my shirt and start the hour-long journey home, over weirs and up rocky inclines along the banks of that beautiful river. One day, I arrived to find the farm empty of livestock and the house being demolished by men in two large excavators. As I arrived, the roofing and wall lining had been removed to reveal the skeleton of framing of the many rooms of this ancient structure. Revealed in the centre of it all and perfectly intact was the original single room slab hut with split shingle roof. I ran between the two ex excavators and their cursing operators and collected a series of remnants. This was the first of what would be a series of barely legal archaeological digs and the start of a life of collecting. But more important than the artefacts are collected was the powerful realisation of that single moment when all is lost to the irreversibility of the process of demolition. 
Mine is a vast and undisciplined collection. It is the result of archaeological digs in many places. The builders' yards at Hadrian's Villa and Villa d'Este in Italy, beside road works in the pyramids of Giza, ploughed fields of Agrigento, walks through empty villages in rural Japan, and the Thames at low tide always in visits to London. Also, the junk and antique markets in just about every place Susan and I have ever visited. Our design process is often driven by a curiosity for objects and places and the way in which disparate objects can be linked by coincidence. These coincidences evoke an interest in the commonality between seemingly unrelated things, as their histories are both specific to place but also have parallels elsewhere that we can draw upon. The objects assembled in our own living room are interesting, not so much for any particular aesthetic value, but more the representation of the people, moments within time, various technologies and cultural practices that they exhibit. We appreciate the influence of local craft on a society that has grown around its traditions, but at the same time we're fascinated by different societies and their history of making. We often look for ways to incorporate different making processes and add them to our own. In 2016, for our exhibition Coincidences, we invited 13 photographers to take a single photograph of two of our buildings and find their own story of translation between the two. Almost all were unexpected and their stories were collected and added to our own. In 2007, upon completion of the Nigel Peck Centre at Melbourne Grammar School and well after withdrawing their objection to our design, the National Trust asked me to speak at their annual conference. It's only recently I've been able to, to admit to this. <laughs> I presented a simple thesis that was so much of the important heritage fabric lost in our cities that we should place a higher value on all that remains, but be able to find ways to build contemporary fabric more appropriately in very close proximity. I then presented a, a, a diagram of a bell curve. It registered a sad truth. The span of an architect's career and life that encompasses gaining experience, establishing practice, the fertile years, and finally retirement has a parallel. An unfortunate occurrence is represented on this curve as the period of 30 years or so between those fertile years and the span, on the span of the remainder of a life coincides with the degrading of building fabric and shifts in the requirements of original purpose. This means that so often architects live to see their best work being demolished or substantially altered by a next generation. My reason for illustrating this was not so much the personal sensitivities of our profession, but the need for earlier recognition of the value of the best of what we do. The idea that memories can bind within a physical space can extend to whole parts of a city as we appreciate the cultural context that we work within and the generational influence that is evident between practitioners over time. The Arts Precinct here in Melbourne provides us with a map of this network of influences of contemporary practice over several generations and the accumulation of knowledge that is evident in the contemporary work. 2017 was a year of flux and disruption. Trump had just come to the White House proposing a wall between America and Mexico. Syrians were marching across Europe trying to find a safe haven and our borders remained closed while our leaders debated immigration policy. While preparing to launch our book, This Building Likes Me, to celebrate our 30th anniversary of the practice, I sent a questionnaire around asking all of our staff where they were born, what university they attended, and where their parents were born. This search for the DNA of our practice was commencing. As part of a very involved Christmas present that year, we paid for our staff to have a DNA test. This generated a lot of interest and, pr and prompted many members of our team to delve into their diverse ancestry and share it over many lunches and Friday night talks. From this came a larger story and the theme of hybridity became a central focus of our year. There may well be a link to the origins of my gathering of both objects and people that has set in train a type of practice that celebrates the variance of collective endeavour. And so the upside down at the bottom of the world bowl was designed with assistance from friend and collaborator Simon Lloyd to celebrate this fact. It was dutifully accepted by our staff who then went about finding uses that ranged far beyond my conception of purpose. <laughs>
This research into collective memory also registers our interest beyond the people and places evident in artefacts to the landscape itself. The myth that prior to European settlement, Australia was an untamed wilderness has been dispelled, most recently through books such as A Million Wild Acres, The Biggest Estate on Earth and Dark Emu, as well as the research of a whole new generation of academics. The complex and sophisticated systems of land management used by Indigenous Australians have been revealed through gathering many threads of memory and early reporting to make more complex our appreciation of natural landscape. This knowledge is instructive as we reframe contemporary land practice to combat the results of global warming and land degradation. Engagement with First Nations communities is a rich, complex and rewarding endeavour that has infused a new layer of collaboration to almost all of the public commissions we undertake as we learn from languages that better describe the Australian landscape and the custodianship of place. There's a necessary rush to make up for time lost. Encouraged by our engagement during 2020 with the Jaja Warung elders through our design phases of our Bendigo Law Courts and the Palawar community when designing our University of Tasmania Cradle Coast and Inverest campus buildings, we're instigating a series of initiatives to create a better framework for these engaging conversations. We have in the last year started our Reconciliation Action Plan, and I'm now joining several of our team who have completed the Foundation in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Cultural Competence course. My studies will span my entire lap of Australia as I deliver this address. Our Biodiversity Bushfire Recovery Project partnered with the Royal Botanic Gardens Victoria to raise funds for research and seed collection in fragile ecosystems and has expanded our interests beyond our design of the new Nature and Science Precinct Herbarium and Sea Bank project. Still awaiting government funding. In perfect counterpoint to the intense demands of practice and the urban settings that we work within, Waterview on Bruny Island has become that important other place. Bruny is overtly beautiful with evidence of its past always ready to surface in the form of, at times, difficult conversations. The second Utsun Symposium was held there in 2014 and Johanny Palasma, Rick Laplastri, Lena Tramberg, Adrian Carter, Matt Hines and I tutored young architects from many other places in the Shearer's Quarters and its surrounding landscape. And also our neighbour's shearing shed while a team of veterinarians artificially inseminated their sheep over the course of the week's classes. Richard Tonetti, Satu Vanska and Brian Ritchie have played music there. The NGV held a design camp there, Journeys into Contemporary Making, as well as three Tasmanian narratives, gatherings, and an AIA symposium that is to become an annual event. Through our Bruni making workshops held each year, our staff learn from skilled craftspeople about the cultural values embodied in the process of making. Our activities include an observation deck, a sundial that tells the time accurately between 11.45 and 12.15. <laughs> a series of fire pits. A bridge. A table for a community. A bathhouse. And a kiln that span the coastal edge. Richard Flanagan visits these and as well as inciting passionate conversation has donated 18 copies of his novel Wanting that will be distributed each year by this single volume vending machine that I've designed that will be made with the guidance of his friend Kevin Perkins, Tasmania's great furniture maker and our regular tutor. Just pull the handle, one should come out. I look forward to interlacing specific cultural knowledge from research about to be undertaken this year into the pre-colonial history of this important place. Our time within a pandemic may well have adjusted our focus more critically to the details of light, air, outlook and all those assembled elements that register our sense of belonging. There have been very few buildings that have engaged and sustained my interest that have been either devoid of fine detail or carelessly assembled. This characteristic of architectural composition amplifies human endeavour in a sequence of occurrences. Firstly, the invention of a small detail that may cause materials to merge or separate or be formed in a particular way is an acutely creative act that then encourages the participation of highly skilled others within and beyond the practice to develop then fabricate. 
These processes can also encourage technological invention to occur. We've always had a preoccupation with the making of things. This curiosity takes us out of the studio and into many workshops and factories to form relationships that have endured across many projects. This interest draws us backwards and forwards, back into the history of materials and making and forward to new applications of craft and the implementation of new technologies. The bespoke and the idiosyncratic was somewhat lost in the 20th century as mass industrialisation celebrated repetition, standardisation and highly processed materials. In the 21st century, we find ourselves working on digital platforms that interface directly with the digital technologies of industry, more akin to the artisans of the 19th century who infused craft with technology. We add to this equation the craft of materials usage and the critical evaluation of the whole process, process of resourcing and assembly to accord with new metrics for sustainability. Within the practice, we feel that this is an exciting era as new forms of craft are evolving that link more strongly to communities' values. Manufacturing processes have influenced patterns of settlement, regional variance and generational identity of those involved in every aspect of such enterprise. Discovering things that are conceived, developed and made within one region is one of the drivers of authentic experience. A global pandemic has caused us to be critically aware of the consequences of the loss of local manufacturing. For our Bendigo Law Courts, we have worked with the historic Bendigo pottery to produce through new extrusion technology a complex wall tile system that will define the areas of public arrival and congregation. When examining our work and the work of many others, the invented detail of many small elements within a building can be an evocation of the entire strategy of the whole project. Whole essays can be written on the counterweighted stone gate designed by Carlo Scarpa that pronounces entry to the architectural faculty at Venice University, as well as details of merging and holding apart in Castle Vecchio and Foundation Corini Stampalia. Paolo, Paolo Mendes de Roca's inventions with rudimentary elements created under the extreme circumstances of a military junta, and Leverance's great plays with surface and perforation remain primary lessons of their built work. And when I reflect on the work of other Melbourne practices of my generation, it is so often the detail of projects that, that we find the expression of generational influence or intentional reference most evident. I marvelled when visiting with Timothy Hill that remarkable early project of Donovan Hill's The Sea House at the translation of a vastly ambitious proposition for subtropical living that infused every small detail from the turn of a table leg to the fabrication of a latch on a bedroom door. It's possible to invent whimsy and even humour in detail. M3 can compose levity in a mosaic of pixels across an entire facade while Durbeck block jaggers can compose a stair, a light fitting, a window reveal or a handrail that appears to be laughing, though I've never been sure if it's laughing with us or at us. In our own work, we've been more absorbed by the invention of detail rather than its refinement and recently self-critical that so many of these highly invested details have a lifespan that rarely survives beyond a single project. In some current projects, we've established rules to propagate repetition and reduction. The project-specific detail is an expensive aspect of our project resourcing, but the interaction with skilled others and the exposition of their endeavour is one of the great rewards of this practice. This concern with fit and assembly translates to the scale of the city itself, as we frequently seek to find accordance with, and at times disrupt, the patterns that exist beyond the boundaries of our commission. In doing so, we position our work as an active agent in the evolution of such places. At times, the patterns may be lost or barely register in the jostle of a city, but can be reclaimed by architecture's ability to recall. I commenced architectural studies at RMIT as a new era began. Graham Garner's dean devised a new syllabus and shaped a new course around some academics from the old, with many more recruited to accord with his script. Anne Rado and Michael Jorgensen introduced us to the work and writing of Robin Boyd, as well as some wonderful sessions spent with Kevin Borland in the studio, touring his houses and building sites. 
Joe Bradley taught us architectural history that stopped, that stopped short of the work of this hemisphere. Alex Selenich told a form of architectural theory that veered off course to encompass other forms of creative practice. Peter Downton and Greg Missingham taught a subject referred to as Downton and Missingham that introduced postmodern theory, while two blokes called Rex and Ron taught us to draft with rotaring pens, leaving us largely alone between their visits to the Oxford Hotel. <laughs> what was most defining was the arrival of Peter Corrigan, whose first day was also mine, and his first lecture delivered in full denim, a revelation. His earliest lectures were anecdotal and largely stories of practice, particularly from his experience as a graduate architect in the US as he just returned to Australia. He brought to life Paul Rudolph, Philip Johnson and Louis Kahn. For me, the stories of Kahn were profound, an immigrant outsider who jostled for position amongst the established practices of the East Coast. Years later, visiting Kahn's work at Yale then to Phillips Exeter Academy on a drive from Boston to New York with Nadir Tarani, I was struck by the moodiness of Exeter Library, its brooding form like Kahn himself, relatively isolated from the rest of the campus. And recently visiting the Indian Institute of Management in Ahmedabad to observe one of the great lessons of the equation of singularity and variance. Recently, I reassembled the five glass panes, the window seat, and the ventilation panel of the corner of the living room of his Fisher House, possibly my favourite house, known through the purchase of my first GA monograph into the design of the corner of my study in Melbourne. Corrigan encouraged us to look beyond conventional architectural source material and guided us toward literature and theatre. This was a particularly fertile time in Australian theatre, and Peter was deeply involved in the Australian Performing Group and the set design of many new works. To see Max Gillies in Jack Hibbard's A Stretch of the Imagination and the Hills Family Show at the Pram Factory and John Romerill's The Floating World with Peter's set design remain powerful reflections of a time when he demanded that we get out and engage with the city and all it has to offer. This was in a way just as well as at the, at the time RMIT was moving beyond its old technical college campus into a collection of buildings across Swanson Street a down at heel office building at 200 La Trobe Street, and the former Gossard Girdle factory did not encourage long-term occupation, other than the weekly Corrigan studio session on the top form of, floor of Gossard that would extend into the evening and later into the night at Max Hotel across the road. Peter was brutal in his criticism, equally terrifying and humorous, but warm, deeply appreciative and encouraging of those willing to express their processes in the formulation of ideas. I did three semesters of Peter's studio, two with his great old Melbourne University friend and fine mind, Jason Pickford. I distracted myself in the middle of my fifth year entering the Melbourne Landmark competition and won one of the age's 10 prizes. I was awarded $100 for my entry that via a massive water wheel redirected the Yarra to provide a constant three-storey high wall of water along the entire length of Flinders Street. At a series of intervals were provided, a series of intervals, uh, openings and apertures were provided through the muddy brown wall of water to various civic functions. This was a time when Vietnamese refugees were arriving on a fleet of dilapidated fishing boats, which I reassembled into an immigration museum as one of far too many ideas. <laughs> Upon graduation in 1981, I applied for a graduate position at Cox and Carmichael Architects. They had, throughout the period of my studies, produced many great residential projects. Peter Carmichael could design a house appropriately zoned for an entire family with next to no passageways. The growth house for civic builders, as well as the others for merchant builders, remain remarkable examples of project houses, far more spatially sophisticated and appropriately scaled than the dull tract housing currently being rolled out across our outer suburban landscapes. These houses were un uncluttered, largely unadorned, but extraordinarily inventive, as every detail of structure and fabric was deeply considered. Many of these elements of construction came with me into my early years of practice. Their beautiful bridge that crosses the Yarra at South Bank endures as one of the city's great civic markers. It was an architectural practice of great generosity, much humour, long lunches, tax deductible, and fine stories of the antics of these two eccentric partners. 
It was also a fertile seedbed that to my calculations spawned 10 Melbourne architectural practices from those young staff that were there during that exact time. Thank you, Peter and Robin. The link between universities and the development of young design practice, practices can provide a litmus test for the health of creative enterprise within a city or region, and in turn define the cities themselves. This image captures at the Tarawara exhibition in 2004, many of those who had undertaken the Masters by Project program established by, by Leon Van Skyke at RMIT. I completed my Master of Architecture by Project in 2001 with Leon and Sand Helsel. Entitled Cut Threads and Frayed Ends, The Character of Enclosure, it consisted of a substantial amount of writing, many diagrams, and a constructed object, a music stand for a middle child, which due to its late arrival and complexity was assembled by about eight joiners during the course of my dissertation to the panel, uh, assembled panel of critics and audience. It was, after all, a last minute thing, designed in a panic and constructed in nine days from start to finish. The theatre of its assembly greatly benefited my presentation. Some years ago, I spoke at a conference in Shanghai. I visited an antique market in the old town. While looking through the many stalls of ceramic objects, a young guy asked if I'd like to buy a genuine Ming bowl. I expressed interest and agreed to follow him. We walked for several blocks as the streets became smaller and turned to laneways, then to passageways between light courts between buildings. We turned many times until we reached an ancient timber staircase within what appeared to be an empty building of many rickety levels. Another guy fell into line behind us and I started to feel apprehensive. Up two or three levels and two more joined in the procession. At this point, I began to feel concerned for my safety. Then the leader of the four unlocked the door to an empty room then closed it behind us. Panic set in as I considered the likelihood of a violent encounter about to take place. Just as he opened an old cupboard and removed a small wrapped object, I decided to run. As I fled for the door, I saw him unwrap and held to the light from a single window, there appeared the most beautiful bowl I have ever seen. By now it was too late. Whilst admiring the bowl frequently, I'd already pushed one of the guys to the floor, leapt for the door, hurled myself downstairs, descending to the ground level. I shall never know its value or authenticity. I'm fairly certain the four weren't archeologists, nor potters, but they'd had plenty of opportunity to do me harm and didn't do so. My moment of panic remains one of my great regrets. Small objects such as these can be considered marquettes that can be scaled up through discussion as they are infused with aesthetic value, acutely express the processes of their making, and like architecture itself, contain stories that encompass utility and cultural practice. As a material, it remains enduringly contemporary. My first ceramic pro uh, purchase was a prop in a David Jones store. An enterprising member of their design team had traveled to Copenhagen to collect items to background a uh, Danish fashion show. After much persuasion, I was able to purchase it at the end of the festival. It's a teapot possibly designed by Eric Magnusson that exhibits social equity as it rotates to allow for many hosts and exhibits a hierarchy of glazed and unglazed elements. Some years later, I designed a coffee or in fact tea table to extend its expression of sociability. I imagine this as, a, as an object that could be, could be set within many households and imagine trying to encourage Ikea to take on until I saw the six joiners struggle to carry it from the back of the van up the 20 steps into our house. Our proposal is one of the five invited entrants for the new Australian Pavilion in Venice in 2012, advocated for a complex system of terracotta segments that were developed with industrial designer, Simon Lloyd. Fired from a mix of Australian ochres and Italian soils, ridges and seams created a, vig a vigorous texture that we imagine would be made by the small terracotta factories that at that time were under great threat in and around the Veneto. The gallery's outer profile formed the outline of Palladio's Loggia del Capitano, which then formed an open side suggesting the informal Australian marquee. The sheer complexity of the idea appeared to terrify the jewellery. It was apparently the first to be discarded and remains one of our most glorious failures. Wall tiles that sample Victor and Wolf's colour sequences, 
and a ceramic floor tile based on an Islamic interpretation of a banksia flower have been developed for our marsh wheel project at Marion Bay in Tasmania. The systems vases were devised also with Simon Lloyd as vessels of constituent parts in the same way that a house will contain separate spaces that accord to the various functions of living. Also, the first of a series of topography bowls is in production, each suggesting separate aspects of landscape while also providing some form of culinary utility. This year's staff Christmas present. A visit to the historic bottle kilns of Stoke-on-Trent with family in England later found expression in discussion with our team when we were designing the learning and teaching building at Monash University. These towering forms and associated gathering spaces also invite parallels between the process of firing that starts with the malleable clay and the intense process of tertiary education on the raw matter of young minds. When visiting Louis Kahn's Exeter Academy, I saw the Harkness table and learnt its story. It was developed at Exeter and named after Edward Harkness, the American oil magnate and philanthropist who suggested its intent, an education system that proposed equity between educator and student. It's a very egalitarian idea, although its form rather conventional. We meet our clients at such tables, as it is interesting to see how our eye contact works and how conversations flow across a table and how the shape of a table can give form to engagement. I've designed a dining table for many of our residential commissions. Each table is different and conceived toward the end of the project, reflecting a deep understanding of our clients' lives. There are links through the, this gesture to the craft of making, to the materiality of the project and the narrative of our engagement. The table in our, in our Captain Kelly's cottage combines an original 1820s gate leg table made in Hobart and used in the old cottage by our family for many years and a pedestal table made in Sydney in the 1850s. They're joined by a section of new Tasmanian blackwood with an overall impression that each object has retained its own detail and story, but combined they make an eccentric new social setting with an inconvenience of legs. Our idea needing to be made table was the central element in an exhibition of contemporary ceramics at Heidi Gallery. Measuring 20 metres by four, it was made from 36 discarded tables sourced from op shops and gum tree. The strange collection was transformed by the serendipitous coming together of legs nearly touching, edges meeting, and sinuous gaps between, an unlikely community of tables. In doing so, territories were created to allow the curation of variants within the ceramics community. Tables for universities now infused with technology encourage discourse group driven learning. In doing so, refer directly to Harkness's initiative. I've always considered these tables that span nearly the entire history of the practice as not part of, the, of the, our main game. But in reading Rachel Hurst's essay, Organising Spaces, Organising Lives, I do appreciate that in a way they are footnotes in a chronology of stories embedded in small objects that represent an endeavour in the making of much larger things. As a young graduate, in 1982, I visited Teatro Olimpico in Vicenza. This theatre designed by Palladio in 1550 houses Vincenzo Scamozzi's Trompe Loyal street scenes that exaggerate the perspective from each of Palladio's five portals. Upon entering the vacant theatre, the voice of an elderly Italian man speaking English with an, uh, with an American accent commenced reciting the theatre's history. Initially unseen and then only fleetingly as he walked back and forth along and between Scamozzi's streets, he described the intentions of its great crea creators. He began by drawing upon the compositional techniques used for each variant perspective, highlighting how combined they achieve a performative quality within the space that distorts our perception of scale and, different, and distance. He continued his narrative by describing an additional perception, that of oral shape. Immersing himself within the surroundings, he illustrated his point, projecting his voice in a manner that supported his thesis, that acoustic character also formed within the confines of a space, lending it a perspective reading of equal value of that perceived visually. This idea was heightened in his closing performance as he walked out to the front of the stage, ready to engage with us, his audience of two. He looked straight ahead, missing us completely. We realised that this elderly man was in fact blind and his, percep his perception acutely oral. 
This story has had many lives over many projects within our studio discussions. The recalibrated internal reveals of the windows of Joseph Reed's neoclassical facade suggest the confluence of alignments with the new interior of the Melbourne School of Design. And most recently referred back to me by a team member as the diagram of Teatro Olimpico was modified to become more street than stage. Students and staff become both audience and performer in a new learning and teaching building for the University of Tasmania. The view to beyond is preserved as the portal is inhabited. An appreciation of spatial perception as a means of navigation has informed many parts of many projects. The registering of our place in space and the perception of the world beyond is central to human experience and has informed the planning of many of our buildings as we've arranged spaces, sequ spaces sequentially to unfold frames of experience. Thresholds and portals, those moments of intimacy and engagement, of arrival or outlook, where interior and exterior meet, are cons consistently the most intensive elements of our work. In October 2017, we were invited to participate in the 2018 Venice Architecture Biennale. We developed an interest in Venice in our ill-fated Australian Pavilion competition entry and our successful design for the inaugural Tapestry Design Prize for the Australian Tapestry Workshop in 2015, where we further referred to our exchange between Italy and Australia. In, his work, in, in this work, a series of sets were created to reverse Scamozzi's inverted perspectives, forming picture planes drawn toward the audience. The partial views and variant transmissions of light within each inverted chamber suggested a place that was, to us, elsewhere. Our initial proposal to the creative directors was to build the structure we imagined in our tapestry. It was to be both bridge and portal, providing a long lens from its place in the arsenale toward Australia. Over time, our initial ideas evolved and transformed in part through a process of creative collaboration. Gradually it progressed to become more instrument-like, much like a camera with its body removed to express its working functions, a series of portals that would contain mirrors devised by artist Natasha John's Messenger and films by young filmmakers Coco and Maximilian. A mask combined the inner form and fit of a Venetian mask and the single broad slot that Australians recognise in the hand-wrought steel mask of our bushranger hero, Ned Kelly, known to us through Nolan's Kelly series paintings. Visitors to the exhibition were invited to look within a vast cantilevering quilted timber portal toward a cinematic representation of places within buildings. Each of these five variant portals suggests both specific and universal experiences of being within and passing through interior space. Somewhere Other was conceived in Melbourne, meticulously constructed in Geelong and clad in spotted gum. With a funnel-shaped form blown in Venetian glass by a master craftsman in Murano and supported on a framework of steel fabricated in a shed in rural Victoria, in Venice, we soak the inner walls with eucalyptus to honour the lessons of that old Italian. When writing his essay, John Wardle is Curious, Rory Hyde wrote that architecture is a fairly low resolution, inarticulate medium. If you want to stage a grand epic, write an opera. If you want to explore emotions, write a poem. We're working within an era when narrative is one of the primary descriptors of the creative endeavour of architects. I would separate what I would describe as the narrative of authorship and that of experience. Buildings stand for so long that it seems implausible that the stories of their author's creative objectives should remain the primary narrative for the life of the project. In agreeing with Rory, I believe that architecture is a blunt, in a blunt instrument if the author's narrative remains as the primary reading of a building. This is an interesting aspect of our appreciation of architecture, architecture historically. Just as we can be intrigued by the processes of making, it is important that our deeper knowledge records the intentions of the author's creative enterprise. However, sensory, sensory receptivity requires little of such knowledge as we navigate and experience the places that we inhabit. Our buildings frequently contain a series of narratives, but they are told in a manner that requires engagement and discovery, and then a degree of self-interpretation. 
Instead of imprinting one complete story, we, we reveal the suggestion of a story, leaving space for interpretation. The subtleties and degrees of abstraction invite individual experience to become part of the collective experience. We've, co we've coined the term explanatory buildings to suggest that they contain a sort of narrative that explains the circumstances of their making. These are invariably public commissions where collective engagement accumulates stories that provide a conduit of understanding that amplifies the depiction of what, why and for whom this building exists. The facade of the Hawke Building at the University of South Australia tells the story of a conversation with an influential Vice-Chancellor, Denise Bradley. She instructed us, as Denise was wont to do, that the building should be timeless. I responded that it should be not be so, but be of its time, and record the moment when a group of people, in this case a university, had the ambition to make such a significant investment in their city. So a facade that would record time was our endeavour. Sleeves of textured copper were set within vertical recesses in the interlocking precast concrete panels that would over time record the vertigree staining and chart the span of time. We'd not predicted the demise of the Australian car industry and manufacturing generally within the city of Adelaide, which would have accelerated the fluorocarbons required to hasten the ageing process. It is, as a consequence, a very, very subtle rendition of an idea. RMIT International Centre of Graphic Technology, our first educational commission, required a spatial arrangement that developed into a building profile that expressed characteristics of an industrial extrusion. The two ends of the building are treated as cut ends of this extruded strand and with all of the characteristics of the interior revealed as is sliced to a required length. The term open-endedness was coined that, contained, that continued into a series of explorations into extrusion and cut ends where life within the building became part of the composition of its primary elevation. At times we appropriate other people's stories and add them to our own fueling narratives that may or may not be evident in the completed work. C.J. Dennis's Ode to the Sydney Harbour Bridge, I Dips Me Lid, became our I Dips Me Lid. In our case, we dipped to a different Sydney, to the Sydney Meyer Music Bowl, as the single first sweep of an idea in our design for the NGV's ephemeral architecture program, Summer Pavilion. This reference to, to another Sydney pays homage to the exuberant and innovative structure of one of Melbourne's great civic spaces, the tensile structure of one century becomes the grid shell structure of another. This supported a massive polycarbonate ceiling that would pronounce a place for many activities over that summer. In many cities, great civic spaces have been defined by magnificent ceilings, such as Melbourne's Walter Burley Griffin and Marion Marnie Griffin's Capital Theatre and Leonard French's Great Hall at the NGV. Added to this is our own fascination with ceilings, defining places of assembly and shared experience. D.H. Lawrence's note, Upside Down at the Bottom of the World, written forlornly at the end of each of his letters home while in Australia writing Kangaroo in the 1920s, became our appreciation of our position in the world, upside down, adhered by gravity to the base of this vast sphere. It has infused many, many projects over many years, from our failed entry in the John Mockridge Fountain Competition. A Melbourne tram passing through a pool of water would direct water onto the open hemisphere that contained the roots of an elm tree that would then over time reorient itself toward its origins in the northern hemisphere. To the Bradley Forum, the main place of assembly for the University of South Australia in the Hawke Building, and the discussions that informed the suspended studios in the Melbourne School of Design at the University of Melbourne. Much of what we do in this country adapts, modifies, in the process irrevocably changes the cultural practices from elsewhere to fit the circumstances, environment and climate of this location. Working constantly in this context has provided a framework of reference that celebrates the rigour of hybridity. The 66,000 small Japanese tiles set into some of the 150,000 small recesses in the concrete facade of this building um, is one such example. Is it a visual rendition of the sound, of, of sound or the impression of sheet music or an interpretation of digital recording? 
are the empty recesses, the moments between sound that has formed part of a composition. The Nigel Peck Centre for Learning and Leadership renders the Ashlar construction of the school's early Victorian basalt buildings in steel and glass and reveals a brick bond that suggests book shelves within its library. And the Shearer's Quarters and Captain Kelly's Cottage on Bruny Island tell stories of landscape, of settlement, of industry, sea captains, graziers and orchardists, carpentry techniques of ship's carpenters, and inflected geometries. These narratives can also suggest the creative coalition with others. The hyperstyle hall of the University of Sao Paulo Architecture School and its moment of dissent against the military junta and many other stories set within the Melbourne School of Design evidence conversations with our partner Nadir Tarani. And the many discussions with Neil Durback and Camilla Block are embedded in the facade of Phoenix Central Park in Chippendale, Sydney. If there appears to be a high degree of abstraction here, it is evidence of such long discussions, infused with humour and distracted by circumstances of such duration that the moment of conception was completely lost. Many of our houses register the theatre of family life through deep discussions with highly engaged clients. The vineyard house arranges social and intimate spaces within the plan in accordance with our understanding of the viticultural principles of grafting budstock to rootstock. The Balanaring Beach House celebrated the fleeting experiences of weekend occupation. And the Fairhouse and Fairhaven House unpacked activities upon arrival and aligned them all with separate moments within a broad coastal panorama. The Diamond Bay House records the disastrous failure of the first design of endless curving walls, unhangable for paintings, presented to artists Gareth Sanson and Christine Healy, and registers Gareth's stinging rebuke in its orchestration of space and massive vaulted NGV arch that separates the two painting studios from the living quarters of, and their personal gallery. Our buildings will happily take on stories of their own and as a sequence of exchanges, the stories will change and blend ours from the process of making with those of countless others in their own personal experience of observation and use. We respond to the work of artists, in this case Gareth, Gareth, to help us make sense of our lives and the world around us and also at times to provide us with moments of release and joy. The ability of art to provide provocation helps, helps us to contend with uncertainties and conflicts that are beyond our control. We've been able to draw into the public realm the work of Fiona Hall, Rose Nolan, Peter Kennedy, Judy Watson, Rosalind Pickett, Danny Marty, Peter Hennessy, Simon Perry, Simon Lloyd, Raquel Kerr, Janet Lawrence and Natasha Johns Messenger, as we appreciate their brilliant ability to interpret reality and challenged necessity. These works located in public places have become shared artefacts and form part of the community's collection. The work of Noro Imai suggested to us that by wrapping with fabric, a surface could be both approximate and, and abstract in its, in its rendering of the form of internal program and create a blurred registration of its detail. Developing further the idea of abstracting the character of a material, in this case, dense, the dense weight of brickwork, being considered as light and fabric light, the expression of water gathering and forming a vast dimple became the genesis of an idea for the placement of two interlocking windows. In 2003, we commissioned Peter Kennedy to create a 36 metre long artwork that ran the length of the window of our Russell Street studio. The neon artwork and so Illumination One allowed us to witness firsthand the powerful connection to the city that can, then can be, be created with the involvement of an artist. This work has now been reconfigured by Peter to turn the corner along the facade of our Rokeby Street studio and a neon test panel element has been installed in our Sydney studio. It's taken on a life of its own within our practice. On Top of the World is a program that spacecraft Stuart Russell and I devised in 2012. It is a series of studio roof terrace events where people from across the visual arts are invited to speak. Each guest speaker designs a flag which is then raised with much fanfare at the start of the event. The evenings are a way of bringing together clients, 
collaborators and friends of the practice to learn from each other's disciplines and take a moment to appreciate the different perspectives in art through the medium of a single flag. Art practice is often a focus for broad ranging activities within JWA. At the midpoint of deepest, darkest lockdown, we assumed roles within our favourite paintings. A clever bunch. Just as art doesn't require a script to be appreciated, do we need one to understand a building? And can our appreciation be both universal and specific to place and culture? We do know that we're imprinted genetically and cellularly from generations past. The imprinting of pain and joy and habit comes from hundreds of years of pain and joy and habit, which suggests that specific cultural awareness may determine much of our memories of appreciation. I imagine that aesthetic appreciation is instinctive and relies on memory and the brain's recall of experience from all of our senses. This may suggest that buildings can only speak to an audience in a single language. However, as we counter intellect with emotion, we are so often drawn to collective, ineffable appreciation of aesthetic experience and an instinctive acuity that encompasses the span of time, the geography of the planet and its many cultures. Thank you. <laughs>